Oh, I can speak now. Can speak. <laughs> cool. Hello, everyone. Um, it, thank you all for being here. It's really lovely to be here today on a sunny day with just a really nice view. And of course, it's really just an honor to be sitting with um, my two friends, Tolu and Joanne, just incredible poets. Um, my name is Isabella, and I'll be hosting um, this panel today. Before we begin, I would like to humbly acknowledge that this event takes place on the traditional unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Swilatu, and Squamish peoples. We're grateful to be here, but recognize that most of us are here because of historical and ongoing injustices and colonial violence against indigenous peoples. For those of us who are settlers on stolen land, we have an ongoing responsibility to educate ourselves about the histories of the land we occupy and pledge ourselves to work to support indigenous communities and push for change. For everyone here, we carry with us our individual relationship and responsibilities to place, our stories of movement and migration, of settlement and unsettled realities. Acknowledging the land is an everyday and lifelong process the soil on which we stand is a sentient life force that at all times teaches us, mentors us, collects and supports us. And so I would like to encourage everyone here to reflect, educate themselves, listen and learn from the rightful owners of this land for time and millennia and give back the gift of reciprocity. And of course, we're here in part to support the wonderful um, writing we have in the community. Today, most um, in, today particularly, um, we have Tolu and Joanne's books. Um, Tolu's books is um, Tolu's books is available um, by um, at the table that's being kindly organized by Iron Dog Books, and Joanne. Um, has her, um, it's a very new book, so she has copies of her own if you would like to buy a copy and get her to sign it. So please do support our authors and also local bookstores. Um, Word Vancouver would like to take a moment to thank our generous donors and sponsors, the Canada Arts Council, the Book Canada Book Fund, the BC Arts Council, the BC and Yukon Book Prizes, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, League of Canadian Poets, and many more. And for a full list of our partners, you can visit the website um, for Word Vancouver. And without them, this festival could not happen. So we're very grateful. And this, um, I think, is an important event um, entitled Migrations and Fluctuations. And it speaks to the world that we are encountering. With migrations, perhaps what comes to mind is the butterfly effect, um, whose oscillations in one place have the potential to spark off a resonant chain or melody of effects in places much farther away. But of course, in the face of the environmental crisis, refugee crisis, race and body politics, um, the works of Tolu Olorontoba and Joanne Liao pinpoint also the difficulty as well as a kind of hope of um, what, it's, what it means to move through the world as global community citizens um, and through time, memory, and the future. So there will be questions at the end. And how I'm going to proceed is Joanne's going to read, and I'll ask them a question, and then we'll have Tolu. Um, so Joanne Liao, who I got to meet for the first time today, is an associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan. Her essays, fiction, and poetry have been published in Brick, Catapult, Evergreen Review, The Goose, Io, The Kindling, The Town Crier, QLRS, and Rice Paper Magazine. She grew up in Singapore and currently lives on Treaty 6 territory. Seas Move Away is her first book. Thank you so much, Isabella, and thank you to Word Vancouver um, for inviting me here. I'm very excited to be reading with Tolu. Um, I've really, really enjoyed your book and can't wait to hear you read from it. 
Um, I'm going to do a short reading today, but before that, I'd just like to thank the organizers of the festival, also thank my university, University of Saskatchewan, for the funding to get here, thank my husband, who like graciously accompanied me all the way in this trip, um, and obviously throughout the years, the family and friends who made this book possible. So I'm going to start reading the, fir the first, with the first reading, with the first poem in Seas Move Away, because I think it's a good way to sort of settle into the collection. So um, it's called National Day, which is kind of the day of independence um, for Singapore, uh, a way we, they, we separate it from Malaysia and gain independence from the British. But I think it's a very fraught day. It's usually a day full of fireworks and celebrations and military parades you know, as a kind of post-colonial nation. Um, but this poem is for those who don't quite uh, see it the same way. So this poem is for my friend Philip. National Day. To you who know no other city and you who left decades before me, to you returned, rejected, condemned, censored, trapped. To you non-citizens in and out of borders, to you, you with bittersweet relationships with the land, always trying to explain why, even as I never ask. Because I was different, because I couldn't breathe, because I saw something, because I saw nothing to you everywhere. So the book opens this way because it's dedicated to those who move away, as I have moved away, but many other people have moved away as well. And I think there's a kind of displacement that goes with a complicated idea of home and the idea of home. So I suppose that's very sort of relevant to the panel. Um, so I'm going to read you a couple of uh, poems from this section uh, about Singapore um, and thinking through my own complicated relationship to this post-colonial nation that is also extremely authoritarian. Um, and I, mean, I don't know how much like, I'm sure lots of people know about Singapore and you've been there before um, and keep making this joke that my students come up to me and go, I've watched Crazy Rich Asians, Professor Liao. Now I know everything. And I'm like, no, you don't. Um, so it kind of like disabuse them of this view of it. Um, and so in Singapore, because it's sort of hyper planned space, there is an urban gallery where there's a two scale model of the island with every building and every street. And it has this really interesting sign that says you are here. So I'm going to read this poem, City Gallery, Singapore. This island has its own intimate weight. This road running down the center is its central artery, its tree-lined spine. I want to know its watery heart, all its old depositories, its forgotten views. Let me be miniaturized and frozen in this model made to scale with its tiny sign indicating you are here. I will trace the fickle arc of progress, the pain and pleasure of its geographies, symmetrical, architectural, guttural, breathe in the dust and the constant constructions, the upturned red earth, touch the calloused hands carrying concrete, bricks, rebar, listen to the pile driving filling my head and chest, my bones disinterred by the demolitions. Um, next, I'm gonna read you a selection of poems um, that I wrote thinking about the laws in Singapore, and particularly the laws that originate from the British Penal Code during our time as a colony, but also now have been consolidated and changed and altered and reified by the current government to sort of take away rights like freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. So this particular poem called Public Order Includes um, is taken from words in the Public Order Act, which um, forbids public assembly and protest in Singapore, to the point that even one person carrying a placard with a smiley face on it is considered an illegal assembly, one person. Public order includes, permit me to declare my place in this procession in the prohibited area, to interpret what you mean when you say, I organize, I take part in, where is this regulated place? Where is this unrestricted area? Can I give you advance notice? I'm waiting for you to prescribe how this demonstration by a person alone is a demonstration carried on by a person by himself. Are you an authorized officer? Are you a public nuisance, an obstruction in any public road? Here is my location, date, and time, my number of persons, my purpose, and other such particulars permit me to declare. And how much time do I have? I feel like I don't want to overstep. Uh, you have time. I have time, okay. Um, so the next poem is also from this section, and it's about a law called Film, the Films Bill in 2018, which gives the government to search anybody's private abode um, for 
political films or illegal films. And so they just, they just have this, you know, it becomes this like physical manifestation of artistic expression. You can just walk into someone's apartment under the suspicion that they have an illegal film. This poem is called With Such Force As Is Necessary. Change the letter of the law, don't stop there. The alphabet, the syntax, the lexicon, the shape of power. We know that it is in your discretion to break open any door or window leading to the premises, to remove by force any obstruction to such entry and search. All you need is reasonable cause, a clause altered to make the necessary and willing and able officers of us all. Take our bodies, take the words we write, take the recordings we make of ourselves and of you. We become illegal according to your amendments. A body here, a blindfold there, a mouth taped shut, a cuffed wrist pushes headfirst into this vehicle. We are always at the verge of breaching, even when we stand very still, are silent, refuse to answer your questions, produce your documents, perform your requirements. We are defined by what is withheld, reduce us to writing, read us over, render us, correct us. You know we are waiting to mislead you. Okay, my husband always says he likes these angry poems. So there's just gonna be a lot of anger and angst in, this, in these poems. Um, I'm gonna read you a couple more. Um, I want to read you a couple of personal ones um, about migration. Um, the first one is about my sons, who are now 15 and 17, so they're in that difficult teenage period. They, they hate my poetry, they don't hate it, but they were just like, get very uncomfortable when I, when I read this to them. <laughs> Market of Asia. One day when I'm old, you will take me here in the cold. I will thread my arm through yours. My sons, I will be so much smaller then, but still I will search the aisle for a jar, a bottle, a plastic packet containing a memory that refuses to leave, something that a parent or grandparent once tended to on a stove. I will grasp for the tenuous, the half-remembered, the snatches, my nose to a prickly fruit, tongue to a sample spoon, the seasons and festivals will go on without me, older than I ever will be and more distant. I have only what I learned in books, secondhand, cut by repeated diasporas. I will have taught you the last of the forgotten tones of my mother's Penang tongue, my father's Teochew accent subsumed in it, the Hakka woman who cared for a tiny version of myself, always hovering on my lips. We will reminisce about childhood trips back to the heat of the past, the aunties and uncles, unrelated by blood, who were kind to us, who cooked all that was good, who called you handsome, foreign, other. We will never be able to return. I can see why they don't like, they just don't like this They're getting old and like, you know, they just don't like it. Um, do I have time for two more, you think? I have time for, I do want to cut into your time. Um, I lost my grandmother and my mother this year. Uh, and, you know, it's been really hard, but at the same time, like, it's just coming, sort of coming to terms with it, right? Um, this poem is about my grandmother, who is a very, very tough lady. Um, she lived until she was 99. And uh, this poem is basically in her voice. And basically, I think she, this is her poem. She wrote it. I merely translated it. Grandmother and Inventory. I'm already a dead person. Burn it all, the jewels, the lesser diamonds. Do you want this bolt of cloth? I've given away so much, almost all of it. What can I take with me? Did I tell you I wanted to be buried in this? I don't remember that conversation. Someone has been through my things. They've taken something, that bracelet, my wedding rings, the purse of money, this pendant. You take it. I've had it since I was a little girl. You can't buy jade like this anymore. Please take the sewing machine. Do you want it? Here is the cover I made. I'd like you to bathe me or ask the lady who came the other day, isn't she coming back? I don't know her name. When it is brighter after we have breakfast, I'd like you to open the safe again. It's been so long. Take out every box, lay it all on the bed, unzip every pouch, open every container in the light will be able to see. That was absolutely beautiful, Joanne. I 
and I was reading through your book, actually the arc of the book. And so it's really, um, it's really beautiful kind of to hear your voice as a fluctuation of the book, just um, hearing it read out loud. Um, and also we um, color coded today, but can we take a moment to also appreciate how we're also color coded? <laughs> like, it's just kind of like, yeah. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, Joanne, not only are you a brilliant poet, but you're also a very astute and talented individual in the academic realm of things. And so, of course, these themes that you bring in your collection on diaspora, family, ecological counterpoints, and surveillance, um, they bridge both your contributions to these academic as well as creative spaces. No, academic's also creative. So how has your poetry influenced your academic career? And what prompted, prompted you to express um, the pieces in this collection in the form of poetry? Mm -hmm. I think it's sort of the other way around. I think what, uh, what I do for my day job, which pays the bills, um, really sort of influences the poetry. And all the frustration that I feel as an academic about not being able to be personal about it, and by not being able to be angry, um, not being able to express certain sort of nuanced and ambiguous and ambivalent feelings comes out, I think, in the poetry. And I feel like I'm able to be brutally honest in, or I have to be actually, I mean, writing poetry is this act of brutal honesty, um, of, of risk taking, of critique even, that can happen in poetry that for me can't happen mm -hmm necessarily and also because like as a Singaporean academic you know for a long time you kind of live in fear of critiquing the government and you have to do so in sort of sideways sort of motions and whereas I feel like can they really censor a book of poetry I don't know I'll just say like you know it's poetry this word could mean so many things and so I feel like maybe they also pay less attention to it in a way so you sort of slip in kind of unnoticed so I think that's how that works for me wow yeah I think yeah, that, that would actually, like, your book then would form such a great dialogue with a lot of, like, other mm -hmm. poets who've got an area, we don't want to yeah, call it, do yeah. the same thing. Thank you. And it's also just a great um, segue onto Tolu's work. Mm -hmm. So, Tolu, you ready? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Tolu Olorun Toba it has been a physician, editor, project manager, and great friend, and has lived in three countries. His literary work combines existential analysis with historical and contemporary critique. His debut poetry collection, Hunter of Happenstance, won the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry in English and the Griffin Poetry Prize, Canadian Griffin Poetry Prize. He lives with his family in Samyamu, Katsi, and Kwantlen territories known as Seri BC. His second collection, Each One a Furnace, was published by McLennan and Stewart. And actually, I just wanted to quote one line that I loved um, in your book that I think really brings together both of your voices and your work and why you, know, you being here is important. And here you wrote on page 39, and in time I knew to ask, what's wrong with me? And at last I knew to answer, nothing. Everything I've said is true and necessary and beautiful, and I am essential. So, Tolu. Thanks. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, thanks for that uh, lovely welcome, Joanne. Um, I loved the incisive poems. I wished you could just take like 10 minutes of my time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't dream of it. <laughs> uh, so when, when you spoke about uh, criticizing the government or, or a censorious government, uh, you know, if they were to ask a, a poet, you know, who's the I in these poems, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, well, plausible mm -hmm. deniability, the I is um, exactly. a, a lyrical cre uh, creation, and um, it's uh, everyone and no one, and um, anyways, uh, that was just a thought, uh, it's like if my family ever asks me who's the I in these poems, I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> don't ask me, <laughs> it's like, Please do not ask me that question. Um, thanks to the uh, to the festival organizers and thanks to you all for being here this evening. I will try not to read too many poems. I'll go ahead. I'll read fewer poems than I have picked here. Um, a lot of these poems ha um, have an ornithological register uh, following the movement and um, 
characteristics of finches, use that as a vehicle to, to speak about my own movement through different countries, cities, careers, and so forth. But that feeling of um, instability, that uh, transience that has characterized my life um, so far. For the last four years, I've been a little more stable, but before that, it was um, it was it was wild. So um, I read a few, a few poems. Uh, the first one is called Protea Canari. Seren Bifachier, a French taxonomy for two-faced birds named for the protean scrubs they nest in, knowing they have no home. Bioforming takes expeditions, generations of refinement, and journeys to earth analogs. Terraforming will not always work, not fast enough. Bend your biology to the harsh, evolve your own flesh. Almost a hundred years have passed since we first made our way down from the grasslands of the Middle Belt, from farms into cities built around the British. See how continental we be now. Watch our changes to tongue and passport hand, our distrust of nationality, our allegiance to survival. Next poem is called Bill Sweep and um, samples some of Nian Simone's feeling good, or a lot of it, maybe. Um, was Nina feeling good in the down draft of feathers under oracular horn sections within that song that was not of euphoria, but a burlesque of doom, the swing baritone of announcing trumpets, listing instances of molten from old world of pine and bird and dragonfly onto these streets with a song to walk them. Earnest and brisk, we, feathers and the bird they make, blown, tarred skins rippling with us, bent toward the gravity of deadlines, the aerodynamic head tilt into the thing, approach the early bird, down from flying high, its beak in the subway wormhole. Next is called Galapagos. Um, Charles Darwin on his most famous expedition to Galapagos Islands spoke about the Galapagos finches um, and the way, depending on which island they were on, these finches had evolved based off of the, uh, the food sources present. And I was just trying to draw a parallel between how people who move around um, evolve in response to their local environments uh, out of necessity. And even though they're the same as the people where they came from, but they have had to become something else. Out of Nina's hand, igneous plate, fickle water. A seed go goes in, we grow each generation its own intermediate of insensibly graduated beaks. A song comes out when we find the food we can find. The food says what our mouths look like. Our mouths say what our songs sound like. Our songs say how and if the hunting party finds us. Our jaws have mouths for each season. The greater number, jet black and brown. Each island of dispersion, whatever quaver closest to the key of demand. Premonitions. One, carbon-based. Everything is not right, but there aren't more people combusting in the streets. Wasn't all that was needed friction, some oxygen, and willing bodies? Those who watch the geopolitics of effigies, who see the stockpile of bodies in flammable cities are, are concerned. Everyone is waiting for something. We are compacted, smokestacks walk in, cloth bonded, and those who distrust this calm beatific shelter in place, waiting for someone to ask, wouldn't a little heat be a good thing? Two, wars of glass. Some skies are hard and will break your neck if you fly into them, and people will step around your body on the sidewalk. I have a broken neck, 
so I thought to tell you about getting in these offices. Amidst the forest of raised hands, glassy fingers, and low visibility flight, people tend to hurl themselves forward. All I know are the wars of glass, the striving birds and their causes, and that to enter the only path, the forest must gape itself at you as you pick your way through the barcode skyline. Green singing, and in this form, I make reference to the word tribal. Um, I grew up in Nigeria. We, uh, a lot of cultures in Nigeria have um, scarifications that are used to identify what ethnic group or, or culture an individual comes from. So they're colloquially called tribal marks. Our fathers had tribal fault lines, the ones we stepped around, carved on their cheeks. We listened for clues, the moon a crescent colony of egrets, their reports open in the night for the efflorescence of insect forges, the camera flash of lightning, seeing the things we did before the rain. We cannot stay in this place. So Kugo is the wandering sickness, six incontinence, shedding itchy children into oceans who wade across, wait in line and stamp into elsewhere Flat feet are restless when the grass is fire. We cannot stay in this place. Every land we leave is Mars maroon. We ax the roots of trees we cannot climb for a raft again. If you wonder how our kindling is still an armada, we hid bamboo songs in the stacks of brick leaving the city. We cannot stay in this place. Foreign addresses have not received us. The old mailbox is cancelled. We build a green home on the interstate. Let them drive around this obscurity. But excavators are at the door because what you want must want you to. You cannot stay in this place. And because we've all been speaking a lot about mermaids and stuff, I'll read uh, one about our folk. Um, <laughs> so this one is called Believe the Merfolk. Um, there's a Kenyan artist called uh, Wangechi Mutu who uh, creates a lot of art that features uh, mermaids or, or manatees. Um, legend has it that the, the, the first people who thought they were seeing mermaids were seeing manatees. Um, and um, they didn't know what they were seeing, and a mythology emerged around myself. You had believed us to be beautiful, but in Guva, the manatees, <coughs> excuse me, I'll start again, take your pardon. You had believed us to be beautiful, but in Guva, the manatees of subsea trenches have no light, no eye, no need for iridescence, do have pressured skin, ladle mouths, strainer teeth for plankton. And when the weight of water is good, it is amniotic and we grow flat. Mer people are beached off Indian oceans when fishers disbelieve their eyes, when seashells exile us and we must grow sight, rest fins into hands, leave home, when the things we want invite us to air hunger but we repartee in migrant schools, show elsewhere to trident stabs when we emerge, burned dinghies melted on grasping arms. We have tunneled from under the bioluminous lakes, our skirts occurring for air again in turquoise warning. As torches garden the shoreline, see us fulfill ourselves. The fearsome tide, the phosphor glow, the arcane coral, the carnivore stories swapped by twilight. Believe in us or do not, but here we are. Field dressing cross bill. Um, there's been some discussion recently about the doctrine of discovery and how it was used to colonize a lot of the, uh, the known world really. 
Um, and so this poem mentions uh, as part of other things the, the papal bulls that um, many of these explorers based their um, discoveries on word problem. If after papal bulls gave us to perpetual servitude, we were an animal on its side and Europe ap approached from Berlin with water treaties for the hilts of cross cotton gatlings to wound belief in the solemn word from the breast through coastal incisions and from the belly coils of bronzed trade roots, ivory of our gentle harvest, the embrace of strangers, the ideograms of societies, given concussion, hatred of the vernacular, gunships for awakening. In how many generations did protectorates lose their memory, their language, their once and future civilization? Two more and then you're free of me. No, more, more, more. People have things to do, but thanks. Um, Painted Bunton um, has some references to um, abuse, more or less, or family dysfunction. In family skirmishes that have taken over the world, children have always served as human shields. We can all agree that this should stop. But children, you've been given a job to do, prevent your mother's divorce, your father's suicide, compound the grain you've been given and give it back again. You're the answer, granary in the winter, there will be no solitary deaths. You can't tell bruises from my painted plumes, and if you can, I'd say it was deliberate. There is no fear in love. Spare the rot and spoil, soil the child is equal to, I only shattered, smelted you because I love you, plus x squared. Solve this, this differential equation. Developed from the negative, I worked to be opposite in every way. The solution is the flinch of adult children on the phone, still bowing slightly to the father in the east. Hello. I know we haven't spoken in a while. Atlantic. Canopy undisturbed. I do not know how to descend this tree if I'll be alone when I arrive. Far from the photographer I was in the rain striving to capture friends under an umbrella on bookshop steps, disobeying love. Far from the other country that ate its children, I surrender to repair. There's a ripple of a cure afar. I'm fortunate to be aware of my vivisection. Thanks. Just so grateful for both of your words. Um, Tolu, I had a question for you, and I think you know it started with that story when we first met, and you gave me a copy of your book, and you talked about um, how you started writing through um, Finches and working with Dion Brand and getting that momentum. And it made me think about how, you know, birds bird poetry have always been there historically. You know, they've, they're they as common, you know, as the romanticized moth to a light. So um, as common as candle, they're just so good for poetry. And yet um, over these past decades, you see more and more poets writing about birds, following um, the path of birds, um, and writing about what is at stake, you know, putting that, you know, less romanticized, but, you know, using birds, you know, as kind of an assembly of their own and also as, um, as a way to talk through, you know, issues of, you know, species under ecological, um, ecological crisis um, and species that move. And so why do you think that is? And what inspired you to write particularly about finches? Thanks. Um, I think, as we all know, most borders are artificial 
and birds tend to ignore borders and they just go where they like um, or where they need to or where they must. Um, and something about the way that um, people who migrate or, or move around, um, something about people in that category uh, reminds me of the, uh, the movement, either forced or, 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 or um, I have COVID brain, I can't remember the word, or voluntary. Um, you know, it reminds me of birds that just disregard um, bonds on their on their movement. And I think there's just something very poetic about that. I remember being a, a child and, um, you know, wondering about flight. And of course, I guess that's how we came about the myth of, you know, Icarus and, you know, Daedalus and, and so forth. Um, why do we dream about flying sometimes? I, well, I, I shouldn't generalize. People, some people tend to dream about flying and, and you know, what is that archetype? What, what does it mean? What are we trying to, what does it mean about our subliminal desires? What are we trying to escape? And I think that desire or wish to transcend um, where we are, where we find ourselves, is, um, is something the birds um, help us see uh, concretely. And so that's more abstract. Um, as for why I wrote about finches, um, I came across, yeah, I came across a line in, in Osiris uh, by Dion Brand and um, it spoke about finches and that's how I really started to research um, finches. And the first one I came across was the cutthroat finch, which was, which ended up being the first book, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. first poem in this book. Um, and I was just drawn into it, especially because I had personal history of you know, transience and uh, a feeling of instability in my life at that time and up to that time. And so it somehow came together for me. Um, it, it was a good vehicle for me to uh, to dump all that stuff into. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I love what you said about the borders and birds ignoring that. And yeah, I, I, it's, I never thought about it that way. So thank you. I mean, we still need passports in the real world and stuff. Right? But yeah. It's Some people hilarious. don't have that. Just talk about birds all day. Um, I have a question for all, all um, both of you, um, if it's okay. And actually, this question isn't from me. So yesterday, I was at the Yukon BC Book Prize Gala, and I was talking to um, I was talking to Nazanin Hozar, um, brilliant author of Aria. Um, I was talking to um, Hazel Jane Plante. Um, a wonderful poet, and Micah Kildre, who's um, a reviewer with Room. I mean, sorry, review coordinator at Room. And so, because obviously I've done my homework, um, I asked them, what questions would you like to ask Joanne and Tolu? So here's the question, it's very complicated. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, me first. <laughs> Do I, do I like answer like in a, like- what, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? I have to report back on this. Okay, mistakes. okay, okay. Apricot sorbet. Mm. That's, that's, that's really fancy. Um, <laughs> my, my son works in a gelato shop. Nice. I have no excuse. Okay, um, yeah. okay that, that, I like that. Sorry, my, mine is gonna be underwhelming. Um, my favorite ice cream flavor is my daughter's favorite ice cream flavor. She's six, so that's what we buy. Um, and it's um, vanilla ice cream with caramel mm -hmm. swirls oh, inside. Good. And good. it's just, it's simple, but it's what she loves. Cool, <laughs> cool. good, I'll report back. <laughs> okay, um, the other question is, it's about form. And it's because I love form as someone who's also moved a lot. And of course, you know, you guys have experienced many places to call home, many different versions of home. And so I think of form as a kind of home for poetry. And Tolu, with your book, you know, I was just so struck and um, inspired by all the beautiful forms you bring with this book. And, you know, you definitely play a lot more with form in this book than your previous one, you know, with the prose poetry, with um, 
the listing and like with the web links and everything, it's just so creative. You have to see it to really get it. But also Joanne, you also, you know, you also take on the form of the long poem where you write and trace and respond to the legislators, legislators the legislations. Mm -hmm. um, and you do something really phenomenal with work too, kind of as a way of responding personally, but also politically. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your relationships to form? Um, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. I feel like I've been speaking for no. a while. No, it's not <laughs> reading. Um, sometimes I, I guess because I I grew up and like, you sort of went through a kind of British colonial education in Singapore, I find form very violent. Mm -hmm. um, I find like, you know, there are a couple of poems in here called Unsonnets because I just couldn't write the last line of it. So they're all incomplete. <laughs> Um, but with the laws in particular, I find I, f I find the English language very violent for me. In it. Like I, I find that because of it, because of how it, it sort of made me lose so much of my um, yeah. ancestral languages, I suppose. Yeah. I find it. I find that I'm constantly fighting with it in some yeah. ways. And now, my ironically, my job is to correct. <laughs> imperial grammar right and i'm like looking at my very diverse classrooms and they're they're just like all their accents and writing are inflected by all these beautiful other languages i'm also conscious that many of my indigenous students sometimes don't speak their own indigenous languages and i'm still forcing people to be like paragraph like you know <laughs> thesis um that 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 like you know conjunction's yeah. wrong um and i'm like what am i doing <laughs> right um, so there's one point in my book where I'm just like, I can tell you to break it, but the rules that we have adhere to us like weights, like belts, like stones. And so that I think that's my very complicated relation to not just like poetic form, but just the form that English kind yeah. of disciplines you into. Yeah. yeah. Break the bonds like birds. Yeah. Oh, I, I love it. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry, I can't. Uh... <laughs> uh, so let, 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 let me let me make an attempt. Um, I think form for me is a constraint that sometimes is generative. So if you say, I'm only going to, I'm just making this up. I'm only going to write words in this poem that do not have the letter O, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something silly. Um, it, 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 it tends to force more divergent thinking as as you know that constraint forces you to uh, to consider other things um mm -hmm. to to consider the second thought n not the first thing that pops in your mind mm -hmm. um and so form tends to do that for me and so if the initial idea is either fully there or half formed sometimes form helps me to um to to finish it to, mm -hmm. to round it out mm -hmm. Um, but I'd like to comment on what you said about um, languages and um, th there's a quote that I like. <clears throat> I have no idea what's going on, sorry. Uh, by Chino Achebe and said, uh, that says, um, uh, let no one marvel that we, we write in, in the English language mm -hmm. for we intend to do untold, uh, unheard of things with it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that even though uh, I have a similar history in which uh, English is my first language, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm not fluent in my second language, um, also unfortunately, uh, because it was the rule not mm -hmm. to speak mm -hmm. vernacular, mm -hmm. and then you got reported, you got in trouble yeah. mm -hmm. uh, if, if you were speaking anything other than the Queen's English. Um, and so, um, but taking ownership of that medium, um, a lot of people, people around the world have, you know, taken ownership of the English language and made it their own, mm -hmm. uh, both generally and in terms of, you know, regional dialects, mm -hmm. would say, of English, mm -hmm. and, and they are all valid because, um, yep, it's ours now. Um, and um, we would do what we like with it. Um, so it's complicated. It's it's a, it's a form of reclamation. It, it doesn't ignore the tragedy of losing one's language, but um, it, it it does help us salvage something uh, out of our own internal language, you know, yeah. in which we can express in forms that billions of people can understand mm -hmm. potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my non yeah. answer. My 
rambling no. answers. Revenge oh, break the form. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love non answers, non sonnets. It's, yeah, thank you both for that. Um, and my last question is for you, um, for you two is, I mean, what's what's next and what are you both looking forward to? Because Joanne, you said you spent 20 years in this book yeah. and Tolu, I mean, awards aren't everything, but you know, you pretty top, you pretty much collected the top, you know, like Governor General and Griffin. And so where are both of you in your creative work? Um, what are you working on? What are you looking forward to outside of writing or work? Mm. You go. <laughs> I mean, it's it's all downhill from here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, might as well just. You know. um, no, I haven't been writing a lot of poetry. I've been trying to. We spoke about this, Isabella. Yeah. I've been trying to finally start my novel, yeah. and I haven't written more than the one sentence. Story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to force myself to um, to do something else the weight of expectation around poetry is a bit stifling for me at this time. Yeah. And so I just want to um, turn my attention elsewhere. I mean, I am still writing some poems. I have a yeah. bad husband sequence of poems that I'm writing now, uh, very interesting, uh, but I'm just gonna write those very slowly uh, over the years. Uh, right now, I just wanna do more learning about yeah. different uh, genres of writing. Yeah. And Joanne? Um, I started writing uh, a memoir about um, learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and nice. being a journalist in Singapore, oh, um, I like that. which is strangely enough, somehow comparable, very, very comparable. And uh, it's supposed, it, I, it's under contract with Book Hug, but similar to you, I'm finding it very, very hard to finish it, actually. Um, <laughs> just just really, really hard. Yeah, we'll form a yeah. club, we'll do writing sprints. Um, <laughs> but I, I, it really examines the, the effect of power of bodies, both ways. And so, you know, I'm quite small. So when I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I just get smooshed <laughs> all the time, smooshed. And when I'm in the prairies now, um, you know, they're just these big dudes and constantly squished. So I might not do it for a while, but it just reminds me of that suffocation of power. And I'm trying to sort of think about what if what long term effects it has on my body and all the bodies of the people that I know under the same kind of strain. That sounds yeah. amazing. I'm so excited for that. Can oh. I pre-order it? <laughs> <laughs> no, because not that yet. <laughs> I can't um, so at this point, um, I wanted to open it up to the audience if anyone has questions for our authors. Uh, yes. Uh, one phrase you use when you refer to poems, uh, and it was familiar. Uh, it was it created a, a nervous discomfort. I see, you know, as I see life in many ways. And maybe reflect on part of your cultural and historical geography. Um, Conrad's Heart of Darkness and Apocalypse Now, the modern accent. I, I kind of saw that in that phrase that you used. Some of a horror show, and it was the burlesque of doom. Mm -hmm. And I'm still shaking with that. Where did that come? Where did that phrase? Which part of you did that phrase? I, I wish I, I knew it. Then I would, um, I would invoke it always. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I depend a lot on subconscious associations. Um, I, and so if if I consciously try to um, be clever. It never works out for me, um, but I I wait until I'm in a place where my mind associates it, and so I I didn't construct that. It, it came to me. Um, so unfortunately, uh, I have to disappoint you. I I don't know where it came from. It came from the 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 garbage heap of stuff in my head. Um, <laughs> it also came through your. It, it, it did. I, I mean, I, I lived in a country that many people consider to be hopeless, uh, um, but also farcical in a way. Um, and 
it's it's like a murderous clown. Um, you know, the country is laughable, but could kill you at any moment. Uh, and you laugh so you don't cry, but you tend to watch watch your step because it's dangerous and unstable. And it's um it's a very interesting dance that people who are from unstable countries would understand. Um, so there's all that doom, and then there's all that laughable nonsense, <laughs> and it's just all concatenated together. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to separate. Um, and so I guess that's where that subconscious film sort of came together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, of, of course, uh, if if I if I was to link it to Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness, uh, I, I mean, I try not to. Um, I try not to perpetuate that stereotype of, mm -hmm. you know, being from a country in, you know, that was in Conrad's stereotypical yeah. heart of darkness. But in many ways, um, the truth must be told that these countries are, are very dysfunctional. Um, I believe that changing them or improving them comes from acknowledging that, okay, this is not quite working. What can we do now? Um, and so that's how I approach it, N not as a, um, not as a, a mom or you know, someone trying to, you know, give a version of the same old story, but but as someone who's personally affected by by the nonsense. <laughs> um, does that work somewhat? Uh, yeah, yeah. We're human in our yeah. experience, and that's the first time I've heard where mama used the natural speech yeah. Yeah, I'm very I, pretentious. I, 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 yeah. yeah. It's nice to hear that kind of word. Even though it's in your forced language, it's nice. Great edit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, can I question, kind of observation? Um, no. I think we should see if anyone else has a question for Joanne, just because we're trying to stick them to questions. Uh, Aiden? Uh, yeah, with, with the elements of migration and uh, kind of moving around, I think of like maybe a bit of like uh, surveillance and surveillance mm -hmm. and like, don't pretend to think or know anything about Singapore and somebody that is in the event is not Singapore, of course. But um, it sounds as if there is that kind of element of hyper surveillance, which you allude to and it kind of comes out of your work. Um, and I'm always curious about how the East has had that issue of hyper surveillance, and that's kind of brought in the authoritarianism that's oftentimes coming to these countries. And yet now in the West, we sort of find ourselves we're imposing that particular, you know, surveillance through uh, capitalism, and that we are almost offering ourselves as, as, as puppet, puppets. And how maybe perhaps that 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 sort of that weird thing where like we're all we're oftentimes just saying I'm going to now be under rule of my own self. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything there, but I wonder like how you would, how you see some of that surveillance uh, relationship in, in these societies. Actually, in one of my poems, I talked about I talk about the surveillance that occurs when you apply to, for status in Canada. And I think that certain bodies obviously are placed under so much surveillance when I come in. I mean, the Canadian government knows so much about my family, about my body, about my health, about my past, about my, you know, everything. Um, and I think that the kind of dichotomy between like, you know, authoritarian governments in a particular way and then like, you know, so-called liberal governments in the West, I think that can be very tricky because I think that not all bodies and not all people experience the state here in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and that surveillance here is, well, I suppose sometimes well hidden, and but other times like it truly, truly impacts, you know, whether it's through policing or border control or everything else. I mean, like, you know, I, I look at my classroom sometimes and I know every individual student, and I tell them we have very different experiences, even when we're walking in downtown Saskatoon. Um, and so for me in my poetry, when I think about that, I, I think about how I have to learn I have to learn to put on a certain mask and a certain way of speaking and behaving in order to cross these, right? To to be able to master and, and pass these tests. 
and to yeah. right and to fill in these forms and to be to to come up a certain way on a form yeah. um and a letter and like a, yeah. a proposal whatever and i think that that is in the way that we are sometimes pinned down um on how on how you know we should or must behave as you said like you know some people must right so yeah Anyone else for our authors? Questions on writing, craft, Sophie? <laughs> Thank you so much to you all three of you. Um, I just wanted to get back to your hatred of form. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I, I, did, I was kind of thinking in my mind, yeah, hatred of forms as well. Um, that you were just talking about. Um, and I was just wondering if the was something that was helpful for you to to reimagine a, a, another way of writing? Mm -hmm. um, was is it outside of form? Is it mm -hmm. is it uh, <laughs> beyond form? Is it mm -hmm. form? I don't know. Or is it an, an obliteration of form? Mm -hmm. And I guess with that word obliteration. I guess that there's also so much recovery that you're trying to do in, in this book, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's a great question. And actually, I have an epigraph in one of my sections that's very short. And I'm going to read very, very quickly. And it's from the Canadian Title Manual, which I consulted when I wrote this book. Um, it's very, very technical. But it says, since the observed tide consists not of a single wave, but of the superposition of many tide waves of different frequency and amplitude, it will never fit exactly any of our simple descriptions. And so, I mean, it's such a technical volume, but when I read it, I was like, that's poetry. That's like, that's like poetry. Um, and I, I do feel that way about the tides and waves and the ways in which that kind of metaphor, that kind of like association works for me. But at the same time, I'm also aware of how, how much that is under threat. Like in Singapore, islands have been um, conglomerated for refineries, like coastlines have been altered by with sand from you know other countries you know you disappear an island in indonesia then it becomes like a casino in singapore <laughs> like land or an airport um and like you know we even have like sea border like a fence to prevent people from swimming into the country and i'm like many places have this so i am also like not confident that this is this is going to be like a metaphor that just like yeah. i can run with it because i i also understand like maritime boundaries and like going into research about this is really fascinating because attempts to control the sea and your borders yeah. maritime borders are really yep yeah. yeah yeah thank you yeah i mean yeah i'm thinking about um the sea kind of as something that kind of like finches or birds, they, you know, their existence, they refuse to be bordered, they're voluptuous and yet, and thank you, Sophie, and both of you for bringing up, like my question, I should have said, you know, like, you know, form can be productive and you can break it and that's fun, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the forms and structures that impose our lives and our writing or language, they can be very fragmenting and violent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you. And we are out of time. So thank you everybody for coming so much. And I just wanted to remind you again to support our authors, buy their books. Yeah, hang out. Thank you. Thank you. So, so when, when we spoke on Instagram, I, found, I didn't want